Welcome to Bible Believers Community Church where the name says it all. And what a beautiful day we have out there. The last couple days have been kind of overcast and sunshine and bright this morning. Yeah. Probably the snow we got in the last couple days will be gone by the end of the day, I'm guessing. It feels pretty warm out there to me. Well, now, now we're supposed to go back up into the 50s. You're going back into the 50s. You know what? The, the only thing that, um, by the way, you can turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 22, but the only thing that bothers me about being in the 50s because I'm ready for spring. I like the different seasons and God has it timed out just about right to where I'm ready for the next season when it's time for the next season to start showing up. But hitting the 50 degrees thing, I didn't get out ice fishing once this year and I love to ice fish and, and I think it's too late. I'm not, I'm not one that will go out and push the limits of the ice. If it starts getting warm, I'm done. And it's been getting warm, so. <clears throat> Romans what? Romans chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verse 22. And I'm going to give the, um, the editor of the messages two possibilities for a title. One would be, uh, What's Wrong with the Scholars? That's, that, it could be called, What's Wrong with the Scholars? And the other one is, Which God are you searching for? So there's two different possibilities. Now... Um, I'm going to probably talk a little bit funny because after the surgery, I broke out with canker sores in my mouth. And so my lips are really sore. So you might hear me say some things wrong or whatever. It's nothing wrong with me. It's just that I got sore lips. And the weird part is, is at this point, the canker sores are probably more painful than the surgery. But it just happens. I don't know if when he put... Because when you're out, they put tubes down your throat and all that stuff, and he might have pinched my lip or something. I don't know. But Lisa can say, I break out in canker sores pretty easy to begin with. But Romans chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds four-footed beast and creeping things. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the ability to come in and worship you and praise you because you're worthy of worship and praise. We know that you're God. We know that there's nothing that man can make that will make a God. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd be with us here today. We're confident that you are. You are. Your word says we're two or more are gathered. And we just pray for your blessing on this message that your will would be done here. And uh, finally, Lord, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem and that your hand would be over on all that nonsense going on in the Middle East. Your word prophesied about all of it. And so, God, we just love you, we praise you, and, and we count on you to guide this meeting today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we are talking about um, how man's imaginations are not good. And man's imaginations aren't good. Uh, I made the bold statement that there's only one verse in the Bible that I'm aware of that has any good connotation to man's imagination. And really, it wasn't a good connotation to man's imagination. It was man pleading for God to control their imagination because I think most men who serve God and, and know God know that their imaginations are not good. Um, I was watching a street preacher yesterday and, and in his message that he was saying to the people he was he was talking about when he's talking about everybody is a sinner and everybody dies proving that everybody is a sinner because the wages of sin is death I would imagine if somebody could live a sinless life they would not die but the wages of sin is death and we all die and so uh, he said what if what if I could post a picture up here of every thought that you've had, would there be anything that you'd be ashamed of? <laughs> oh yeah, we'd all have some things that we'd be ashamed of, amen? So we asked the question last week, does, does Satan win? Because Satan thinks he's gonna win, and I know that there's a verse that says Satan's angry because he knows he has but a short time, but if you look at the timing of where that statement is made, that's made in the middle of the tribulation. Right now, Satan looks at how this battle is going and he says, I'm winning this thing. 
And if we look, if we're going to be honest about it, and we look at where the world is and what's going on in the world, it looks like Satan is winning this thing. He's not going to win. He's not going to win. Let me just say it again. He's not going to win. God's going to win this battle. And God allows all his creation to have a free will and a free choice. Um, men and angels alike can choose whatever they want to choose, which makes our topic today uh, very um, appropriate topic, which is, which, which God are you searching for? Which God are you searching for? So this week, moving on to Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, which we just read, verse 22 speaks to most scholars throughout the world. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah. Now, I'm not just talking about biblical scholars, although they're in that mess. I'm talking about all scholars throughout the world. There's exceptions. There's some scholars that recognize God and that um, there's actually been scholars and scientists who had a, a such a hatred for God and for the whole concept of the Bible that they set about to scientifically disprove the Bible and to disprove Christianity. Every scientist that I know that has set about that journey <laughs> has come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as they look at the facts of history, they look at the facts of um, uh, geology, they look at the facts of, um, of, of all the, the historic battles that are recorded in the Bible and the geological finds that they confirm the battles, even to the point of the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, the, the news media and the History Channel and, you know, Discovery Channel, they're not going to cover it, but there have been scientists that have gone over and found significant evidence of chariots being destroyed in the, some of the deepest parts of the Red Sea. As a matter of fact, they call it kind of the um, Egyptian highway because where this took place, there's this kind of wide road that runs from one edge of the Red Sea to the other. It's probably about 40 feet deep there. But on either side of this little road, it goes down to like 100, 200 feet deep. And so on this road, there's all kinds of coral formations that just happen to look exactly like an axle with a wheel on it. <laughs> and um, they, they found uh, uh, formations that look like the skulls of horses. And, and, and so there's proof even of the crossing of the Red Sea. And so scientists that normally seek out to disprove Christianity end up becoming Christians, which it says something about their integrity because they were really truly, they thought they were gonna disprove Christianity, but in their heart, they were searching for truth. And when you're searching for truth, God is gonna reveal truth to you. And so in, in doing so, um, they become Christians. And, and, and But unfortunately, it seems like the higher your education, the further away from God you get. That's the norm. There are exceptions to the rule, but the exception proves the rule. Normally, the higher your education, the further away you get from God. Um, some preachers jokingly call seminary cemetery. And the reason why they jokingly call seminary cemetery is because a lot of young men go to seminary with faith and seminary kills their faith. Um, and then I see the sad truth of, of how Christians worship scholarship more than they worship God. And so there's actually churches that have right in their constitution that their pastor at a minimum must have a PhD in theology. You're asking for a apostate backslidden pastor is what you're asking for because although I know some excellent, excellent preachers who have gone all the way to their PhD, and I'm talking about an earned PhD, not an honorary PhD, you know what happens with preachers? You get a congregation of about two, 3,000 people and some Christian university is gonna contact you about giving you an honorary PhD 
so that they can say Dr. Slipjaw is part of our alumni, part of our school. Mm -hmm. um, and it has nothing to do with how close they are to God. It has to do with how many butts they got in the chairs. Um, so God's not interested in how many people the pastor can put in the chairs. God will put the people in the chairs. God's interested in a pastor that's gonna preach the truth and is going to speak to his word. So like I said, there are some good scholars, but for every good one, there's probably at least a hundred, and that's being real conservative, it's probably more like a thousand bad ones. Ones that, that, uh, that, that turn completely away from anything godly or any godly principle. And the problem is that they think that they're smarter than God. And so if we just take a look at the um, biblical scholars, if we just take the secular scholars and throw them out to the side and just look at the biblical scholars, uh, they believe that their superior wisdom gives them the right to change or correct the word of God. <laughs> so they think that they can, through their scholarship, understand who God is and what God is and, and what God meant. And obviously what he said here in the Bible isn't what he meant because it doesn't fit what I believe. So we're going to just change the word of God to fit what I believe. Which God are you searching for? Which God are you searching for? In our text it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah. And it talks about changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man. They're going to make the God that they want. And the scholars think that their superior intellect gives them the right to do that. After all, who could know more about God than they do? I guess they never really considered or believed Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. Um, th this uh, passage of Scripture, if you don't have it memorized, you should memorize it because this is one of the things that tells you the infallible Word of God. Uh, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Amen. As silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So who's going to keep them? Is the scholars the ones that are going to keep them and preserve them? No, God is the one that's going to keep them. God is the one that's going to preserve them. I've seen naysayers and even Christian scholars who say, uh, you know, these people that say they have the one pure, perfect word of God are idiots. That's what they say. Um, they said, how can God's word be preserved and pure when it was written by sinful men? Well, you're not considering the power of God. <laughs> yeah. And God said, either God's a liar or he will keep them. He will preserve them. And they are pure. So if you have a Bible here that's pure and says one thing, if this Bible changes anything about it, it's no longer pure. <laughs> that's reality. And I want you to think about that. I drink coffee through the service. My coffee is not pure coffee because I like some cream in it. It looks like my wife even put some butter in this one, did you? Um, they call that bulletproof coffee. You just put a teaspoon of butter in your coffee. Boy, it tastes good. I like it. And um, But it's not pure because it has cream and it has butter in it. If I wanted pure coffee, that would just be black coffee. And even though I like it with cream and butter better than I like it pure, it's not pure the minute you add anything. To, even though my taste like it better, it's no longer pure. So if we're going to take that analogy and apply it to the Word of God, it doesn't matter if you like the wording better, it's no longer pure. It doesn't matter if it feels more right to you. Your feelings are deceptive. The Bible Amen. says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And so your heart, your feelings, the, the bed of your feelings is deceptive to you. That's why Jesus said over and over again, be not deceived. Be not deceived because your heart is prone to deception. 
And so it doesn't matter how good it sounds. It doesn't matter whether you like it better. It doesn't matter whether it feels better. My faith is that when God said in Psalm 12, verses six and seven, thy words are pure. There's another verse that says thy words are very pure. <laughs> so it's beyond pure, it's very pure. And if they're pure and God preserved them, that means they're here on earth somewhere which destroys the concept of they're preserved in the original manuscripts because the original manuscripts do not exist. Those manuscripts turned to dust hundreds of years ago, hundreds if not thousands of years ago. The best paper back in that time was vellum, which was kind of more like a leather than it was a paper. It was made from animal skins. And the best paper back in that day probably would not exist after about 600 years. And the Bible is, some of them, some of the books are as old as 5,000 years old. And so uh, the originals don't exist. You're not gonna find anywhere on this earth the five first books of the Bible in the handwriting of Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. You're not gonna find anywhere those books written in Moses' handwriting. By the time the New Testament came around, Valum kind of went by the wayside because they found a much cheaper way to make papyrus. Papyrus is where we actually get the word paper. And papyrus is much more frail and it probably could even last more than about 100 years. I mean, maybe it could, I don't know, but I know it hasn't lasted 2,000 years. Um, you, you know, I have, if you, if it, you ever want my office, I have an extensive library. I don't think I have a book in there that's over 50 years old. I might, but it's kind of hard for me to fathom that any of them are over 50 years old. But you can go to some of my older books and turn the pages and you go, man, this feels frail. It feels like it's about ready to fall apart. <laughs> if you have a Bible that you've used extensively, um, Lisa, on her first Bible after she got saved, and she did a lot of studying out of that Bible, put a lot of notes in it. She didn't want to give it up. It's got duct tape all over it. It's got frail pages from turning pages and all that stuff. Some of the pages are ripped and scotch taped and all that good stuff. And eventually she said, if I want to preserve this, I got to quit turning these pages. Well, that Bible's not even 25, 30 years old. So it's not that the scholars that pres it's not that the scholars preserve the word of God according to our scripture it's God that preserves it and there's a biblical principle that is very sound if you are wise towards God you're foolish to the world so if you're wise to God the world's going to look at you and say oh that guy's just an idiot or that gal's just an idiot they don't know nothing they believe in fairy tales. They believe in nonsense. They believe in things that can't be seen and can't be proven. You know what they call things that can't be seen? They call it faith. <laughs> and in order to be wise, you have to have faith. You have to believe that God is and that he is who he said he is. You have to believe that when these words were penned, that God told the author to write the exact words that they wrote. And I believe when the King James, if you look at the, um, the uh, translation committee on any version of the Bible, you'll never find hearts within the translation committee members that you see in the translators of the King James Bible. Those men were so concerned and prayerful and fasting and put so many checks and balances in the way that they uh, translated that word. There's never been any work in this world done like it before it or since it. So what they did is they broke their translation committee into groups and then into individuals. And so as an individual, if I was on the translation committee, I might be assigned two books to translate. When I get done with translating, it has to go to my little group within that I'm assigned to. And each one of those scholars look at my translation to see that they agree with what I said. And there might be some minor tweaks that are made based on how they understand the translate, translating process. 
when my group is done, it goes before the entire committee. <laughs> And the entire committee looks at that work and the way that it was translated to determine whether they all agree. And there were definitely disputes. You know, the, the great uh, chapter on charity, charity is suffereth long and uh, charity and, and you know, one of their biggest arguments is whether that word should be translated love or whether it should be translated charity and charity won out. And I believe it won out by the hand of God. There's a difference between love and charity. I, I would say that charity, if you want a really easy definition, charity is love in action. Yeah. It's not just love, but it's the exercising of love. <clears throat> and so if you're wise towards God, you're a fool to the world. That's the reality. But if you're wise towards the world, then you're a fool in God's sight. <laughs> Um, we're going to look at some stuff. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Just a couple books beyond where you're at. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 18. The Bible says, Let no man deceive himself, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. <laughs> for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. That's a lot from what God has to say. Those guys out there that tout themselves, you know, they put their thumb, when I'm a kid, you had suspend. I was raised in the country. And then old guys would put their thumbs in their suspenders when they're about ready to brag about themselves, right? Yeah. <laughs> they put their thumbs in there. And, and so these scholars, they want to put their thumbs in their suspenders and talk about their superior intellect and how much more they know than anybody else. And God says, you're a fool. You're a fool. You're not going to outsmart God. We're in 1 Corinthians. Look over at chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Everything that the world thinks about wisdom and, and success and all that stuff is just the opposite from God's eyes. That should tell you something about these preachers that are worth billions of dollars. It, the world will look at that and say, they're successful. And God says, no, no. I would guess that most of those uh, rich preachers aren't even saved and probably a bunch of them are going to hell. And you say, how can you say that? Well, first of all, let me clarify something. I didn't say they are going to hell. I said they're probably going to hell. I'm not gonna judge their heart. Only God knows whether they accepted him or not. But this I do know, they strayed so far from the Bible that whether they're saved or lost, heavy, heavy on them. Heavy, heavy on them. You can't compromise the word of God in order to achieve what the world sees as success because worldly success is not success at all. You're better to be, you know, the, the Bible says, seek not riches nor poverty. <laughs> you know what's perfect in the eyes of God? That middle class, the person that's not dirt broke. And so you see people... I used to have an acquaintance of mine that he lived in a state of poverty and he thought he was being godly by living in poverty. Little did he know that living in poverty doesn't necessarily please God. God doesn't judge you based on your financial status. God looks at the heart. And if you're wise to this world, you're a fool to God. And vice versa, if you're a fool to this world, God looks at you and says, this person's getting it. They're understanding. The world wants to reject everything that's God. We're in 1 Corinthians. Just turn back to chapter 1 and look at verse 25. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. A term that I had to use 
quite often in, in, um, when I was in business. Um, my wife can attest to this for the most part. I can't say I'm perfect in this, but for the most part, I'm a very forgiving person. And so somebody would make a mistake in business. And through the course of conversation with them, I might forgive them of whatever it is they're do that they've done, but I understand how the world thinks. And I'd always give them a word of caution. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. It's a world of difference. <laughs> I'm not weak, but I am kind. And don't think that because I'm kind, I'm weak. If you, if you try to go down this path again, you're not gonna like the results. And um, I think that's how God works with us. God is long suffering. Don't mistake his long suffering for weakness. God is mighty. God is the mightiest thing that's ever been. He's the strongest thing that's ever been. And he's always been plagued since his creation of man with mockers. I had one idiot tell me one time, can God do anything and everything? I said, yes. And he said, can he make a rock that's so big that he can't lift it up? Or so heavy that he can't lift it up? Of course, it's a trap question because if he can't make a rock that's so big he can't lift it up, then he can't do everything. And if he can't lift it up, he can't do everything. And you know what my response to him was? With all Christian charity? I just looked at him and said, you're stupid. You're stupid. When you go to your judgment, we'll see how that argument flies with an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And you're mocking of him. We'll see how that flies. So I'm hoping that you notice a pattern that Paul has been giving us throughout Romans chapter 1. And he has been giving us a, part, a pattern. It starts by making a statement, and after the statement is made, he explains it in the next verse. If you look through Romans chapter 1, he'll make a statement, and we'll, we're, we're seeing this in Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 22 and 23. He makes a statement, and then the very next verse, he explains that statement that he made. He, he explains how that is. And so in our thing, he makes a statement, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And in the very next verse, he explains how that happened <laughs> and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man, made like to uh, and unto birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so... That pattern, if you go back and read through Romans chapter 1, you're going to see that pattern consistently. He makes a statement, and then he explains a statement in the very next verse. And so, think of the implication of what Paul just said. The implication is significant in the time that we live in. It may not have been so significant back in the time when Paul said it, but it's definitely significant in the time that we live in because basically what this just said, verses 22 and 23, it basically just said, anybody who believes or teaches evolution is a fool. Amen. Anybody who believes, they don't have to teach it, just believing it makes them a fool, which makes Billy Graham a fool because I don't know if you realize it or not, by the end of Billy Graham's ministry, he was embracing Theologically controlled evolution. He the gap theory? What's that? No, not the gap theory. He, he believes that uh, God's creation, that God controlled the evolution of man and all that stuff. So it's, it's a compromise, and compromise is never good, Miss Edna. We've talked about that many times. <laughs> compromise is never good, but it's a compromise with the scientific world so you don't look stupid. What is the Greek afraid of? <laughs> The Greek seeks after wisdom. They don't want to be looking stupid. And so as Billy Graham climbed the echelon of world respect, he, he loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. And evolution was becoming more and more significant in history at the time that he was a, a young man. And so in order not to look stupid to the scientists, he believed in God-controlled evolution, that that. Evolution is real, but it's just a divine God-controlled evolution, which is nonsense. God made every creature after his kind. Nothing evolved from one thing to another. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, uh, 
I get this publication that has a lot of books in it. You know, to you know, you can buy these books, a lot of books. Would you believe there are books against the Bible and against Christ? Against, I mean, there's more than one book. I mean, people write books about this. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, the attack is on God, and it has been ever since the beginning of mankind. But we live in an age where, um, you know, back when I was going through seminary, um, we were required to go out street preaching. And I did a lot of street preaching in my life. Um, I never it, I never had a hostile crowd when I was street preaching. And it's not because my preaching is better than anybody else's. It's because of how big I am. <laughs> you know, somebody walks by and they think about doing something to me and they look at me and I'm six foot six and 250 pounds and they say, maybe, maybe this isn't the preacher I should mess with. <laughs> and, um, but there were uh, students in the class that when they'd be out street preaching, they'd get spit on, they'd have cigarettes flipped at them, um, just disrespect. Nowadays, and I haven't been street preaching for a long time because I haven't really lived in a city that's conducive to street preaching. You know where street preaching is? It, I think it's conducive when there's a large city with busy sidewalks. Then people can hear you. If I went to downtown Alamosa and started street preaching, I'd be lucky if there'd be like three people that walk by me in the time of me preaching for maybe an hour. It's just not a busy downtown area. It's not. And so it's not, it's not that I'm opposed to street preaching. I'm not against it at all. But I do watch videos of people that still street preach. I talked about it earlier in this message where I was watching a street preacher just yesterday. Oh, people are getting violent, ugly, insulting, cussing. Um, they, they hate the gospel. They hate God. And, and you know what? If you don't like it, just walk on. You don't have to stop and listen. Just walk on. What are you so afraid of? Are you afraid that there's going to be more Christians? You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. <laughs> Amen? So the problem with mankind, and unfortunately with most Christians, is the time that we live in, they believe they, they fit the category of verse 23. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man. Now, some of these folks that live that, they don't necessarily make an idol, although that's what this is talking about. They don't necessarily make an idol that they bow down to and worship, but they create an idol in their heart because they decide who and what God is. Hence the title, which God are you looking for? Which God are you searching for? Um, they try to place God in man's image, and, it, and that's never going to work. In fact, they are, they're going as far in the time that we live in as to say that we are little gods. No, you're not. You're not a little god. You're not even a teeny-weeny god. You're not even a microscopic god. You're nothing but a human being, a little lower than the angels. Deal with it and accept God for who God is. How does man create their own image, God in their own image? How do they do that? Well, throughout history, it starts with making idols. Um, you see it throughout the Old Testament that they had little idols that they made and bowed down to. You still see it in Hollywood today. Uh, I watched years and years ago that movie, um, Russell Crowe was in it. Uh, Gladiator, is that what it's called, Gladiator? And throughout that show, he had these little these little figurines that he'd set up and bow down to. And the world didn't see any problem with that. Those little images. You know, the thing that gets me is reading the Old Testament. They got, um, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, right? And they brought the Ark of the Covenant into their temple and they set it in front of their god, Dagon. And the yeah. next morning... Dagon was face down, huh, kind of like worshiping the Ark of the Covenant. And so they said, wow, must have had some powerful earthquake last night. I don't know what they thought, but they thought it just fell over on its own. And so they set it back up. And guess what? The next morning, 
Not only was it down on its belly, but its head was cut off and its arms were missing. God says there's not going to be another God. Amen. And you know one of the things that went wrong with Israel during that time period? They made the Ark of the Covenant their God. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't God. <laughs> they made it their God. Mm -hmm. We have to guard ourselves against that at all times because we, through our own vain imaginations, talking about last week, through our own ways of thinking, we create our own God. Man making God. Every single time man is, attempts to make man into God or something other than God to be God, it fails. You can't make God. You can't be made into God. God made you. <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with it. That's just the way it is. Instead of man submitting himself to God, he goes about creating or trying to find a God that fits him. Man wants a God that lines up with their own priorities, their own feelings, their own thought processes, and that's what they want for God. And Paul gives us insight into this. You don't have to turn there, but it's just one page over if you want to, but Romans 3.11, he says, there is none that seeketh after God. They seek after their God. They seek after what they want for God, but they don't seek after God Almighty, the God that's incorruptible and the God of the universe. You know what man seeks for? Man seeks for religion. Man seeks for enlightenment. Seek God. <laughs> seek God. Pray about it. Ask God to reveal himself to you. Man doesn't seek the true God, and it's certain he won't submit to the true God. You know why people hate the King James Bible so much? It's an issue of authority. If you're going to take one version of the Bible, whatever version that is, and say, this is the true, pure word of God, now nothing within your imagination works anymore because there's a final authority that you have to live by. And the King James Bible is the final authority for all the world, whether they recognize it as the final authority or not. And they hate it. They hate a God that says, this is how it is. There's no exceptions. This is the way it is. This is the way you must behave. This is what you must do to get to heaven. And nothing you think or want or imagine is going to work other than what's said right here. And people say, I hate it. Don't tell me what I have to do. <laughs> don't tell me things about God that I don't believe. Maybe that's why Satan thinks he's winning this battle because men hate God's word. They are not seeking after him. <laughs> and all he has to do is throw a little temptation into their brain and they yield to it. They run to it. They jump to it. <laughs> And Satan looks at everything going on in the world and he says, I'm winning. I'm winning. God doesn't stand a chance. And everything that's prophesied is being set up in the Middle East right now. Yeah. Everything that's prophesied is being set up right now. Did you know that the three main countries in the Gog Magog War are getting all together right there on the northern border of Israel right now? Right now. Gosh, we could be blasted out of here as Christians any day now. I think it'll be springtime because I, if you look at Song of Solomon, it implies, you know, the Lord says to his bride, come up here. And it talks about the, flat, the, the winter is gone and the flowers are blooming. Indication is it will be in the springtime. And so uh, Satan thinks he's going to win because... And I'm going to get a lot of hate mail over this. He's a Democrat. He's rigged the election. <laughs> Listen, I'm not against Democrats. There's good, there's saved Democrats, there's lost Democrats, there's saved Republicans. I, I mean, I said that more as a joke than anything else. There's saved Republicans, there's lost Republicans. Um, it's not your political party that determines how you stand with God. 
but I will say this, in America where it's a democracy and we still have a vote, you shouldn't look for candidates based on party lines. You should look for candidates based on how they line up with this word. Yeah. That's what your uh, determining factor should be. So I realize there are a bunch of Christians who are going to disagree with the concept that I just articulated about Satan thinking that he's going to win. But let me ask you a question. And, and beyond that, everything that we've talked about. If the human race is truly seeking God... Why is it so few find him? Because the Bible says there's few that make it into heaven. The path that leads to destruction is broad and wide. And many that go in there at. And we have promises in the word of God that says if you seek him, he's right there. You'll find him. So they're not seeking him. They're not looking for him. They don't want him. They want the God of their own fashion. They want the God uh, um, that, that fits what they want to believe, not the true God, but the God that they want to build. Uh, and, and their language, that when you hear them talk, if you engage somebody in a, a theological conversation, they'll say things like, I wouldn't serve a God who, and then put in whatever blank you want to put in, because they all have different reasons why they wouldn't serve a God who, whatever you want to put in. Yeah. Or they'll say things like, uh, I don't believe God would ever, and fill in whatever you want to fill in. That says that in their heart, the only God they're going to worship is a God that fits their fashion. The God that does things the way they want things done. The God that thinks the way they think. That's the only kind of God they're going to ever submit to. And God is God, and it doesn't matter whether you would serve him or not. You're not going to change the fact that he's God. It doesn't matter whether you follow him or not. It doesn't matter whether you believe him or not. He is God without compromise. And the only way you're going to get to heaven is submit to this God and do what he says. What does he say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, you got to confess he's God, <laughs> and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so any other fashion or thing that you want to do, going into a confessional doesn't save you. A priest doesn't have the ability to forgive a single sin. Going to a confessional doesn't help you. Doing acts of contrition don't help you, help you. Being a good person doesn't help you. Good people go to hell. Saved people go to heaven. And so, uh, as we see people searching for God that suits himself, we'll find all different types of God. The God who allows smoking but forgive, forbids drinking. <laughs> The God who will allow drinking but forbids, forbids smoking. The God who forbids either one. It just depends. It's the fruit, It's the flavor of the day. Whatever they want to believe, that's the God that they're going to worship. The most prevalent today is the God who tells you the Bible isn't enough. That's all over the place in the, in, within the church. They'll say you need the traditions, not just the Bible. You need to know what man has done throughout history. You need uh, experiences. You're, you'll experience things in your life. And if your experiences are contrary to the Bible, you got to go with your experiences. That's what they're telling you. No, your experiences will lie to you. You always go with the Bible. The Bible is enough. The Bible is the complete will of God put in written form it's, you know, the, and, and I'm actually kind of tired of this, the people that made this an acronym, but the, they made the word Bible an acronym, basic instruction before leaving earth. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, if you use the letters, it spells Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth. And so, um, um, but it is, they'll say that the Bible's not enough. You need the Book of Mormon. And they'll hide them, they'll hide behind tricky words. Uh, the Mormon church, using that as an example, they'll say they believe the King James Bible so far as it is properly translated. 
In other words, if you say anything from the King James Bible that doesn't fit their theology, they'll say, well, that's not properly translated. No final authority. Man doesn't want a final authority, and that's what it comes down to. There's other religions that use other books. I mean, the, the Islam uses the Quran, and the Quran doesn't line up with the Bible. You know, the only prophecies in the Quran that have come to pass are prophecies that Muhammad copied right out of the Bible. <laughs> huh, I should tell you something. Here's the last point, and it's that God never changes based on humanity or what society dictates. If society says we embrace the Rainbow Coalition, no, we don't. The Bible doesn't support that. God doesn't support that. Society says we got to allow abortion on demand. No, we don't. The Bible doesn't support that. God doesn't support that. The Bible is the final authority, folks, and it doesn't matter what society is doing. It doesn't matter what the popular trends are. Um, it's the word of God that is the final authority, and it's the word of God whereby all mankind is gonna be judged. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. God, I pray that this message will have impact, that it will um, help some people find their way that maybe they didn't know their way and help them to erase the things that they've built about you in their mind that aren't biblically based and start searching the scriptures to truly figure out who you are and follow you in truth. And God, we love you. We glorify you. And it's for your glory that this message was even preached. We pray that it would have its perfect impact. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's